Hi everyone, this is James from F9 Audio and the Freemasons and welcome to this walkthrough of the Logic version of our new F9 Tracks release, Beach House. Now if you're new to F9 and new to Tracks, this is what you get in this release. Two of these, two fully functioning, complete DAW projects, heavily based on multi-sampled instruments running MIDI parts. Now as you can see, this is not a small project. There is a huge track count here and it's for a very good reason. We want to try and get across as much technique, knowledge and sounds as possible within each project. And to do that, we're actually coming across a variety of different styles in pr of production and different techniques. So let me show you exactly what I mean here. This is part of the first one. This is one project called Riptide. <music> So I hope by just skipping through some of the tracks here, you can see the huge amount of content that is in there, in this um, in this particular production. Um, it also is going from light to dark. You've got the warm chords at the beginning and those tougher sections with all those great little sounds hitting in and out. We'll go through all of that a little bit later on. But also in the middle section, we have a breakdown that goes half time. <laughs> And this is what I absolutely love about tracks, is that we are able to uh, show you exactly how we're doing these kind of transitions from musical parts into different sections, um, giving you great arrangement ideas, but also loading you up with a whole series of sounds. Now, as you can see, there is um, some audio files on this page, but wherever possible, we are using multi-sampled instruments running MIDI parts, and you have full control. You can install all of the instruments as uh, channel strip settings and ESX24 patches into your own library, use them in your own productions, but you can also use these as templates. Now, because everybody sometimes likes uh, a little bit of things on the page when they actually start writing, we've also got beats only startups of both of the main projects um, that just have the drum programming going on, but all of the rest of the instruments from that production without any MIDI parts on. So you've kind of got a semi blank canvas with a great um, house beat starting point. We've also got a completely blank session, which has just got some basic beat programming on with all of the sounds from the library available on that page. Now, the one thing I would say about the way we've structured this is we are using ESX24 uh, patches, multi-sampled instruments and menus. We've um, perfected our sampling technology at F9 over the last few years. Now, that means that they, uh, the instruments load up very, very quickly. ESX24 is an incredibly efficient sampler. Um, so when you actually do install the channel strips into your own library, you can access them from your standard library uh, tab here. And I think I've got them already installed yet. Yeah, there we go. So say we just wanted to change that hat into something else. 
let's pick them up. Use a channel strip settings first. Beach house, channel strip settings, drums and effects. And let's put the closed hats on that. That's how quickly they load up. ESX24 is very, very fast. Now, the one thing I do want to say quickly before we go any further, if you are installing this uh, pack and you're using High Sierra, particularly if you have um, installed High Sierra over an existing operating system, it is possible that the Spotlight Index gets broken in OSX and Logic won't be able to find the files that it needs to run these projects. The reason being is that Logic in the background uses Spotlight to actually find its sample files. So if the Spotlight database is broken, even though you've got them in the right place, it won't find them. Please read the manuals that come down with this. And um, we've actually created a video that's on the F9 site and or, or sorry, on our YouTube channel showing how, how you can rebuild the Spotlight database to make everything work again. Now, you will find this not just for the F9 releases, but for any third party content that you have in Logic, it can suddenly disappear. But it is a dead easy fix. OK, so let's start looking at the constitute parts of this production. But before we do, um, I just want to draw your attention up here to this H. You see it's orange. This is the hide view. So if you have the uh, hide buttons hit on any of the tracks, when you've got it in this orange mode, you can't see them. So we've got two hidden tracks in this production. I'm going to click this open so you can now see them. There's the buttons that allow you to turn the hide tracks on and off. So that will select which tracks disappear when you hit hide. And we've got two side chain triggers. A bit of a tongue twister that for me every time. I'm going to open up the MIDI parts. This one is dead simple. As you can see, it's just triggering a note uh, on every quarter beat, so in other words, where the kick drum would be on a 4-4 tune. Now, we're not using a kick drum. If I open this up, we've just got a blank version of the ESX24 that's being triggered. Currently, it's sent off to bus 1, and bus 1, uh, you can see it's appearing here on the, uh, the channel information section, but the auxiliary that it's connected to has its output turned to no output. So what that means is we're actually sending the side chain out to a bus so that we can pick that bus up in any one of the compressors that we use later on. But on the auxiliary that normally pushes that out to the stereos, we've got it disconnected, so you're not hearing it. Now I'm going to turn that back on temporarily by coming to the auxiliary output and just reselecting stereo out. Solo the track a minute. And that's what's being sent out to that bus. And we can pick that up on any of the compressors that are going to be side chaining later on. Now, what's important about this is because we're using a sine wave, we could say tailor the release portion of the ESX24 amp envelope to change the response of the compressor if we wanted. And the reason that we're actually using a sine wave is to prove that A, you don't need to use a kick drum, and sometimes something more controllable like a pure sine wave will work better. Now, anything will trigger a side chain. It is just level detection after all. So having a pure tone like this and then being able to tailor its envelope can be important. Now off to the second one, and I'm just going to turn this back on so we can hear it too. Solo just this track. And we've got a very simple little beep, one bar, one at the beginning of each bar, and that's it. Now, it will become apparent what we're doing with this later on. Um, and you may have seen a bit of automation happen on a piano part. That's the part that this is uh, happening on. And what we're going to do is duck down very quickly at the beginning of the bar and then use a slow release on the compressor to bring the sound back up. It's a great uh, processing trick. But just setting these up right at the beginning, they're just loop parts and then taking them off so that you can't hear them during playback. And uh, hiding the tracks is a great way of tidying up your session. So let's start off by looking at the beats. Now later on, some loops come and join in the party a little bit. So nice crisp drum sounds are the order of the day, and we've spent quite a bit of time designing these drums in some of the best uh, drum orientated samplers. Now, as I've mentioned before, uh, not all samplers are equal. Some are dedicated to percussion instruments, like, for example, NI's Machina um, and the brilliant new um, Akai MPC2 software. These generate great drum hits, and that's what we've used to build this entire library. And then we are triggering them back using the built-in tools here, but we're starting from a great sound set. Now, we're actually just using ESX24s and sound menus for most of this. And this is to prove just how much you can get out of this. Now, because of that, if you want, because these are sound menus, we could select any part, say just the kick here. 
and use the transposition function of the MIDI part to try different sounds. And we could audition that in place. Now, obviously, the processing on this particular kick drum is specific to this kick, but I'm sure you get the idea with all of these parts, you can just start uh, customizing this straight away. Now, it's actually a quite, quite a fairly simple beat. Um, we do have a couple of audio files in there as well. We've got a Oberheim DX in the studio at the moment, um, and we use one of the claps here. It's got a particularly sharp 8-bit sound to it when it's tuned like that, and it just sits in there nicely. Now, uh, to make the claps work a little bit better, or to give them a little bit of uh, kind of interest and feeling, we've got a number of them um, put together or playing at the same point, and a reverse clap patch as well, which plays here, adding some real interest. Now, you notice there's a skip just at the end there, and getting those kind of ghost parts, the bits that are going to um, be affected by shuffle heavily, exactly right is key to this kind of rhythm programming. We are using 16D and uh, or 16C and then additional quantized swing there. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but on most swings, you start from 50%, and then as you increase from there, the swing uh, actually goes up, or the, the amount of swing happens. Now, I've often wondered why that happens, and particularly when I saw NI's machine, and it starts from zero, and then as you turn it up to about 20s, you get the same as, say, about a 61% swing from an MPC. Now, it's because initially you had the option of pulling the note forward instead of laying it back with lower uh, numbers lower than 50. But as it turned out, us humans just really prefer everything a little bit more laid back. Well, no surprise there. So I think NI, when they developed machine, just went, well, to be honest, it's no point. We may as well just say it's a percentage of swing as an actual we decided that swing is laying the beat back, but it has created two slightly confusing quantized grids. Now, if you go to the F9 um, YouTube channel and to the F9 site blog, there is a, th a collection of three videos heavily discussing swing and its influence in music and how to use it inside DAWs. If you've ever wondered about this function, I do really encourage you to go and have a look at those videos because mastering it and mastering different swing values in your drums can be very powerful. Now, a number of house loops are generating a little bit of atmosphere. They are audio files, but we've separated them out here so that you have full control. But adding to all of that, right at the bottom here, are these grunge loops. Now, this is one of the effects menu patches, and it's got a whole series of effects laid out on the keys, but a few of them are quite foliage. And it's this one we're actually using. Now, if I totally solo that part, you'll hear that it's quite subtle. But now let me put it back in with the rest of the drums. But this time I'm going to, now I'm going to play that section again, but this time I'm going to mute it in and out. So we start with it in. It really adds something, and it adds some atmosphere, and it adds some reality to stuff, because it is a Foley recording in stereo doing some great things. Now, I'm getting quite obsessive about adding these layers of noise behind productions and adding this kind of reality to stuff. I'm convinced that as humans, it makes us accept quite pure tones. Now, one thing I would say about that is every single one of you with a smartphone has the ability to record Foley. They've all got voice recorders on them, and some of the compression inside of the microphones, um, microphone circuits for those devices, are brilliant at bringing out these kind of atmospheres. Now, here's a great tip if you are using your own Foley recordings and you want to use them as stereo atmosphere, because normally off the phones they come in in mono. So I've got a mono file here of uh, 6 a.m. recording in Brighton. If you look at an EQ curve here, I've rolled an awful lot of the bottom end off, and then I've just copied that track onto uh, another place there. I'm now going to copy the audio file down, and then what I'm going to do is just massively offset that file. And we'll, we'll go for a four bar loop on this, so we'll chop it there and there. Actually, let's just, that's not in the right place. There we go. 
Now I can pan one side left and one side right. Actually, we'll bring them in a bit because there's quite a lot of bird chatter going on there. Add a bit of reverb to that once it's grouped and then compress it. You'll be amazed at what you can get out of it. So now let's have a look at some of the other drum parts in this production. <laughs> So quite a few things happening here. First of all, we've always got the classic high pass kick, so exact, an exact copy of our kick drum. And then we've got a high pass filter applied to it so that we can use that just before the start of a new section and copy the MIDI data across. And then you'll get this effect, a bit like a DJ does, bringing the bass out just before it actually slams back in. Now from this point on, some percussions starting to join in, and this I'm going to show you now is one of my favourite patches, running completely in MIDI. It's a sound menu of uh, percussion instruments that we took down to one of the um, under road and by the sea subways in Brighton, stuck a couple of microphones up and recorded the results. Now, not only do you get the natural reverb of the subway, and sometimes those places can be amazing, but right in the background, the reason we did it by this particular subway is that you can hear the noise of Brighton Beach just a little bit in the background. Now, all of this kind of um, imperfection starts to add up on a track and sound really good. This is a great patch to actually stick into your own productions. It's really got something, and you can EQ it quite heavily. It was recorded with decent microphones and processed carefully so that you can distort it and uh, get some odd tones out of it as well. Now, obviously, a lot of this stuff is incredibly subtle, but it all starts to add up, and you add some reality to your productions. <laughs> Now the audio cues that we get from Real Reverb places stuff directly. So when you've got recordings that actually have some of that space on it, but are deliberately designed like this to fit inside an electronic production, they can really counterpoint um, the, the kind of purity of synth tones very well. So now let's have a look at this transition into the halftime section. <laughs> So we've got some good stuff going on. It's a uh, main halftime bit, the main grunge of it is coming from this loop. And when you tune loops down like that, you get that great swing sometimes just on the last beat. It's being picked up with a nice vintage snare sound. And our trusty uh, Oberheim DX snare drum. Sounds like the snare from I Got You, Babe, doesn't it? A live hi-hat patch playing a MIDI part that's got some nice little trills in it. There's a timbale fill into this section, and there's timbale fills throughout this entire piece. They are audio files, but we've given you a ton of choice. Nearly every single one in this uh, pack is, is unique, so there's plenty to pick out and uh, do your own stuff with. We've got another percussion patch firing a few bits off. More electronic in tone, this one. Um, when you add that together with some tasty halftime kicks, you've got a great little section. But now we've got a transition from this halftime tempo back up to full time. And that is what I absolutely love about these tracks projects. We can show you exactly how to do it. You can investigate this project, see how it's done, look at the processing, the automation, and hopefully grab some great insight and some great ideas for your own production. But you can do all of that within the comfort of your own DAW.
Now, just before we head off to the musical parts of this production, I just want to draw your attention to another one of the effects patches here. So at the very bottom octave of a normal MIDI keyboard, we've got some Foley sounds. And higher up, we've got some chord samples. So they're all tuned right for these two productions, which are both in D minor. Now, we've got the mod wheel set up on the ESX24 on this particular patch so that it's controlling the filter cutoff and also adding to the volume of the patch. So that means you can play a hit a selection of notes, almost like a chord, if you like, trigger some of these samples and then ride in with the mod wheel a great uh, sort of pressure rise. And because the envelope, the amp envelope of the ESX is set to shut right down, you can just, as you stop, it literally all just cuts. There's no effects on it. They're nice and stereo and wide as they are. They don't need to do anything else. Now, we've also used the same sound set and uh, on a different track, heavily high pass them and set them almost as down lifters. So you can just whack collections of these. <laughs> and get some great downlifting and kind of cymbal type effects. Now to show you that in action, let me just play you this section here with the part soloed. Now, if you're fed up of just using white noise um, downlifters or cymbal effects, then um, things like this, having some new tricks up your sleeve can really pay dividends. Let's hear that now in context with this actual whole rise. <laughs> So now let's look at the bass parts in this production and it starts right at the beginning with this low bass patch. Designed from the ground up to really work in club productions and you can hear just how well that's fitting with the bass if I mute uh, the other basses here for a minute. The tone of the note is still sticking through so you really hear the pitch, but it's really adding a nice little bit of weight underneath it. Now that is joined by a squared bass patch. This has been sampled with round robin sampling, so each note is slightly different and it's kind of rolling through, I think a selection of about six of them. Now when you add these two together, they're playing the same rhythm, they really start to bolster up. But you hear that there is an extra note in the bass part of the low bass. So you're keeping that rumble, but then we're really pushing a certain um, timing figure with that main part of the bass. Now, this is then joined by one more patch uh, called the slow gear bass. It sort of rises gently. And it's EQ'd in a particular way with a lot of the sub taken off and pushing the lower mids to really bring out that growl. Now, this actual patch is from raw oscillator waveform. So if I turn off our filter for a minute and take the EQ off and the mod, you'll hear exactly what the patch is underneath. And the synthesis is actually happening, or the filter control is actually happening inside the sampler. So you've got a great deal of control of this patch. So we can really change things uh, quite dramatically. Now, what this part is actually doing is almost sliding in to the squared bass part above it. Now, if I just solo both of them for a minute, you'll hear what I mean. Now let's add all three together. Now that's a great bass layering workflow. Every sound has its own frequency area pretty much and they're all working together in tandem. It takes a bit of practice to get these kind of things exactly right but this is why it's good that we can show you exactly these kind of processes. Now we have grouped all of the basses together in this production and put a compressor across that group bus. Now that compressor is then picking up the side chain that we saw at the beginning of this video from bus one and just triggering every time there is a kick drum. Now it is still being triggered by that sine wave but it's on exactly the same position and it's doing a great job of just nicking some of the bass out every time the kick fires allowing them to sound proud. It's classic side chain behaviour but it still works and it will always continue to work. <laughs> Thank you.
Now, in the halftime section and some of the other breakdowns, we've got a live bass part, and I'm just going to turn some of the file magnification down here. You can see the audio file. This is what it's doing. Now this is from a five string bass and a five string bass has an extra lower string that normally a bass guitar finishes on a low E string. This has an extra string underneath that allows you to get real subby notes out of it. It sounds great in this section because we wanted it quite dubby but obviously a live audio file is no use to you guys. So we have also created a five string ESX24 patch for you. Now in the lower registers you've got the actual chromatic notes but at the top you've got some slides that allow you to do some quite clever stuff. So here I'm just going to play along with this piece. I've muted the uh, main live bass and I'll show you how playable this patch is. <laughs> So now let's have a look at some of the keyboard instruments and the star of the show has got to be this Rhodes patch. And you can see just how much processing is actually going into it. Double of some plugins to get that really choral effect. And it's got a lovely crunch on some of the higher octaves. Now it works perfectly within this track and it's EQ'd specifically to work in these kind of productions. <laughs> As always with tracks, most of the principal instruments are being played back via MIDI parts, so you can click on any one of the regions and see exactly what we're doing and how we're getting these rich chord voicings. Now don't forget in Logic, if you're in the Piano Roll editor, if you select a number of notes, it will describe the chord as it sees it, or as it thinks it is, over here on the uh, top left of the, uh, of the Piano editor. And this is saying it's a D minor 7 with a ninth involved. What's the next one? We've got a B flat major 7 with a ninth. Now sometimes this can all get a bit confusing, but if you want to know a little bit more about how we're voicing this stuff, click on the notes section of the two main projects. Now here we've got our session notes. These are available in PDFs inside the download as well, but we've added them to the actual session, so you've always got a reference within the actual projects. And here we pretty much describe exactly how we've made uh, these records in terms of music, so all of the chordal stuff is at the top, production, beats, basses, synths, etc., and the mix, and how we've put everything else together. So continuing on with the keyboard patches, and we've got this lovely Mellow Rhodes patch. And it's great at just picking up a few notes. It's playing here with the main one. So different tones there completely. And electric pianos are incredibly versatile and sometimes that provides a problem for sampling. So we've decided to sample these incredibly full of character. So one of them's really short and staccato, that one's a little bit more laid back. Now talking about character, we've got a great upright piano multi-sample here. Deliberately thick and heavily processed on the EQ. But that EQ was actually burnt into the sampling process, so it provides a great way of just picking out certain notes. And even the clipping really helps it stand out. Now our main piano is a grand piano patch that we've shoved through a guitar amp simulator. It sounds impossibly dirty, but when you hear it in the track... Sounds great, doesn't it? Almost a bit like an M1 piano. Now, if I take the amp simulator off, you hear that it's quite a clean piano patch. So don't ever be afraid to take the gloves off with um, instrument processing, particularly acoustic instruments. They really do take to distortion well. So that section is nice and melodic. Now let's look at the darker end of this. <laughs> So 
So this darker section has really got a nice growl from this um, heavily sidechain piano patch. So let's have a quick look. You can see that there's a ton of processing on there and it's got a number of compressors. Let's look at the first one. Now, this is actually picking up our bus two sidechain. Now, that's the one that's triggering every single bar. So it's set to really hit hard when that happens. And then it's got a very slow release. So just watch the graph and you'll see what I mean. <laughs> Now another compressor is then directly after that picking up our bus one sidechain and that's pumping with four to the floor. Now add some clever automation to that and you're getting a really interesting. And now let's hear that back in context. So very atmospheric and a great way of using overprocessing and a completely different way of thinking about side chaining. But I'm sure you can hear there's an awful lot of other stuff grinding away in the background on these productions. Now, for both of these projects, we created an entire bank of heavily processed melodic hits. And they're being joined by some of the effects, hits, and loops that we saw earlier. And you can see the MIDI parts that we've got here that are triggering some of these. Let's play you a section of this back. Now let's hear them in context. Now, to add just a touch of old school flavor into that breakdown, we've got a kind of gated diva note. With a great tape delay on there and a touch of automation on the feedback. But it's that transgate feel to it that just adds a little bit of vintage flavor to the whole thing. Now, an awful lot of these sounds were actually made inside of Logic using Alchemy. Alchemy's got a fantastic granular engine uh, built into it. Now, there's a ton of synth sounds in these productions as well. For example, this patch, which is mellow but still cutting. And that's used in the halftime section. <laughs> But rather than go through every single individual patch, I think it's now time to jump into the second project because this video is starting to get epic. So this second project is called Driftwood. So there, once again, tons of MIDI stuff going on and an enormous track count. We're up to about 104 and it's still nice and efficient. That is the beauty of using just the ESX24 as a main instrument within this. And it's all nicely color coded so you can kind of see what's going on, but it really does change flavor, this entire production. So at the beginning, we've got this nice uh, mellow Rhodes part. <laughs> Now 
Now the funky sections you heard earlier. And later on in the piece, it really takes off with a few uh, more slightly live sounding instruments. But it's all interspersed with these excellent breakbeat sections. Now, please note, we're not trying to make nosebleed drum and bass in this production. Um, we actually want to really capture some of that Balearic vibe and some of those kind of Ibiza sundown bars. <laughs> So this is heavily melodic um, and there's some great movements in there and what we really wanted to show you with this entire piece is how you can grow a production by using slightly different musical parts throughout it. Don't just copy and paste, really think about your arrangement and grow it and try and bring different instruments in. Now once you do that, it, obviously it can get out of hand but we'll hopefully show you here how you can kind of keep all of that under control. And the trick is to not overthink things and go into crazy grouping situations or make your life far too complicated. So let's start by looking at the breakbeats and how we're getting these to gel inside a 4-4 production. This, there's a number of audio files that make the breaks up. Here's the first one. And you hear the snares are not normally where they should be, so you've got that wonderful uh, broken feel to the, uh, to the actual breaks. There's another atmospheric one triggering underneath, playing the same kind of thing but with different sounds. and a tiny little glitch file. Now you add all of that together, this is what you get. With a tambourine, a staple of breakbeat firing away in the background. Now we've actually got a cleverly edited version of that break that's working just in the house sections. And you'll hear that tambourine in there. That's what's starting to gel these parts together. Now, to get some of the transitions right, let's have a look at some of the automation. And we've got a very clever repeat where we've taken uh, kind of three sixteenth beats of a bar and just repeated that and then dropped um, uh, dropped the top end using a low pass, uh, low pass filter. And then we're back into the 4-4 section. Now let's just solo an awful lot of these drums so you can hear what's going on. Now you have to underpin those kind of breaks programmings with some fat kicks, which we've got floating around at the top, and actually a clap as well. But let's see what happens as when we put all of the drums in, firing out of that sec. Great, it sounds really natural, and that's just some nice processing, some nice EQs, and some clever use of balance. Balance is the key to all of this stuff. I see so many people fire into stupid EQ chains and compressors and things like that, desperately trying to get something. We're actually just a decent bit of EQ and general balance, and not overloading things so much would really make a difference. Now, as we said, these beats have got a wonderful broken feel to them. And for, uh, for me, I love this style of breakbeat programming. And it, for me, it references some of the great drummers from the 70s that changed drumming and rhythms forever. Now, I'm talking about the likes of uh, Clyde Stubblefield, um, Harvey Mason, who played with uh, the Headhunters, and Bernard Purdy. Now, these guys came out of the jazz scene and then sat with fusion and funk bands. Um, but because of their training and their ability to throw rhythms around, they did some absolutely unique stuff that is still being felt today. They're their influence is all over modern drum and bass music. So I always recommend you go back and listen to some of these masters at work. It's incredible to hear what they were actually capable of. Now the percussion track on this production is quite special. We've grouped it all together because there's a lot of tracks inside it. We've got our subway percussion hits again and a collection of hand percussion here running as MIDI. But then we've got a ton of audio files running certain things. We've got, for example, this live shaker. A cabasa firing off in the background gently on the kind of open hi-hat beat of a house um, rhythm. 
one of my favourites, this metal percussion instrument that actually was made in Ghana. It's just dead simple, um, but it's got a great sound to it. And wood blocks. And of course, because we're in England, there's a pint glass as well. You'll see I've panned them in slightly different directions. So getting all of these bits to work coherently um, is quite a job, but once you get a great percussion track like this, it can really add everything to the rhythm. But one thing I would say is, um, if you are into starting to record your own percussion things, you don't need to spend a ton of money. Now, a lot of the shakers that I've actually got in the studio are homemade. I opened up a shaker once and found out it was nothing but a bit of plastic and some rice inside. So I then decided to go around the pound shops and find the, the, the stiffest plastic containers that you could, get a whole series of different grains just out of a supermarket, and then start to build your own shakers. Now, that's what you're listening to here. Obviously, the cabasa is not that is a proper instrument. And the pint glass, well, that's obviously a pint glass. But as I say, a lot of this stuff, you'll be amazed at what you can uh, do with the stuff around you. But one thing I would say is absolutely vital if you're going to record percussion is get yourself a ribbon mic. And we're really lucky here that we've got a, a pair of original BBC spec coals. But recently we came across one of these in a second hand shop. Now it was actually damaged, but then I looked it up online. And because of the price, I just bought one uh, to see if we can actually test it and use it for recording percussion. It's been amazing. Naturally dull, excellent at recording things like tambourines and shakers that if you put them in front of a condenser mic will sound far too harsh and you'll spend all of your time trying to soften them back up. These naturally have the tone and can also be a great addition for recording things like guitars and just general things around the studio. Even try them on backing vocals. They do take a bit of post-processing because they have a very different tone to what you'll be used to. But they're incredibly cheap. Look at this, £86 for a great ribbon microphone. There's an even cheaper one here with a lower frequency response, £57.95. Now, I think we've used one of those in the past to record a cymbals, and it, it, it was ever so dull, but it had this wonderful lo-fi edge to it. So if you're into recording your own bits, they are great investments. Now, we've used a variety of ribbon mics to record some extra cymbal swells and percussion hits. There's a pair of coals in stereo there, and then we've got a live bell. And some live ride cymbal taps that really help bring some of the breakbeat sections together. Let's put them all in solo. And we always find that the mixture of organic material against program has uh, always worked. It just seems to prick up our human ears. We like things to be slightly different, but we also love that repetitive nature that you can only get out of drum machine samplers and synths. Okay, so now onto the basses. And the first bass sound that you're gonna hear is this kind of nice subby square wave bass. But nothing really to mention there about that. It does what it does and it works perfectly. What I do want to show you is this funkier section because we actually used three bases to get it right. And it's a great example of layering sounds together. So the first sound is quite modern. It's synthetic. It's from a semi-modular, uh, sorry, semi-digital um, synth with an analog front. It's from the Novation Peak and it sounds like this. <laughs> Now you hear it's quite very, very mono. That is joined by a great big fat Jupiter 8 bass in uh, unison. So that means four voices of the Jupiter 8 are on the left hand side, four voices are on the right. Nice funky bass sound, it sounds awesome. <laughs> And you hear the round robins firing there, so every note is slightly different. You get no machine gunning. But right underneath everything, you've got an analog-styled 808 bass sound. And you add all of those three together, bearing in mind, once again, they've all got their own sort of uh, frequency range, and this time, spatial positioning. The first one and the last one's a mono, uh, and only the second one is uh, the Jupiter 8 is in stereo. <laughs> Just a touch of uh, bass EQ there. Now, a lot of people look at some of my EQing and say, well, why are you rolling all of that sub off? Well, 
often with these kind of patches, you've got so much of it going on, you need to keep the base end under control. Always remember with a low pass, uh, sorry, a high pass filter, that you're not actually just simply removing the stuff underneath that amount. You're keeping it under control with a particular um, curve. And this one is 24 dB per octave, and we're at 33. So we've still got frequencies underneath 30 going on. It's just keeping them under control. People seem to look at a curve like that and go, "Ah, oh, you're getting rid of all that sub. Well, most of your speaker systems can't actually replicate it anyway. It's only great big subsystems that are going to go underneath um, 30 hertz. So it's just something to be aware of. Learning to use high pass filters like that in, in tandem with uh, shelving filters um, and keeping your bass end under control really makes all the difference. Now there's a great drone bass happening on the breakbeat sections with a, some uh, tasty automation on. Just got an example here. I've kind of added a couple of extra bits of automation so you can see that we've still got a nice degree of control in the sound. And at the end, once again, a live bass takes over. Now this time we've gone a little stage further, as well as another multi-sample patch of that particular bass sound. Now we have processed and recorded that slightly differently, so it is a completely separate patch. Um, we've actually created a MIDI part doing a similar thing. Now the reason we've done this is to show you the difference between a tight program part and an actual live bass, even though it's pretty much the same sound. Now the jury's out for me as to which is better. I love the tightness of the program one, but I love the feel of the live instrument. <laughs> that you can put flourishes in there that you probably wouldn't be able to do on a live bass as well. Now, once again, we've done the same as before. So the lower registers of a keyboard instrument will play the chromatic bass. That does sound pretty grungy by itself, but trust me in a track, as you've just heard there, it works. And in the uppers, we've got slides, hits, and buzzes. These are great for just throwing in now and again to add real spice and uh, make it sound like a pseudo live performance. Now, in this production, we're using a mixture of real uh, Fender Rhodes and programmed Fender Rhodes. We just wanted to show you the difference between the two instruments. Now, the uh, Fender Rhodes is an incredibly interesting and complex instrument when it's recorded because you've got all of these mad kind of semi-distortions happening, um, almost acoustically and also through the electronics in it. And particularly when you start to add pedals and all that kind of stuff, you get some great sound. So we record ours, we've got a Suitcase 73, and we record it through a, a brilliant Digitech chorus pedal with some taste. EQ. Now here's, here's two parts playing together. And in particular what I want to show you is this bit here. You've got a wonderful high chord that's spread almost allows a guitarist would kind of uh, slowly strum a chord over the top of a solid lower register chord. Mix them together and it's magical. And it's a sound you've heard on tons of chill out music. And one of the reasons it works is there's a thing called stretch tuning in all electronic or uh, electromechanical pianos like this. That it's not actually exactly to the same scale that we would be normally working to. It's got a richness to it. It's deliberately tuned to sound uh, warm and rich. Now, we've also shown you those kind of techniques a little bit later on with um, some multi sampled uh, suitcase sounds. Here's one. And that's playing actually against one of the live parts. Here's 
hear how spreading those top chords can really, really work and help pick out and make those things sound glorious. Every now and again, it's a great idea to just turn the quantize off and um, and just play stuff in and see how you get on. Now, if, you, if you're not confident in playing anything in, but you still know how to use chords, then actually, let's just go into the MIDI part and see that all we've done, you can actually pretty much draw these in. You could just spread them across the actual downbeat of where the chord should hit. So it's a great little technique for really adding some interest to your chordal work. Now, all sorts of pads and synths are also in this production. We've got this great Gothic style pad. what we call an uber pad down here at the bottom. Now for users of the Logic Toolkit from F9, these are not the same uber pads, they're a different set. And there's a ton of stuff going on here. Now we haven't got time to go through it all, so let me just so you, solo this one section and uh, you can hear all of this stuff working together. And even here, some of it's driven in there, but it sits beautifully in with the uh, breakbeats. <laughs> I've forgotten one of my favourite bass parts in any of these tracks productions so far. Look at this. But enough of my love of slightly questionable fusion bass moves. There is a pair of synthetic guitars working away at the bottom of the final sections of this piece. Don't sound much by themselves, and there's two patches, they're at different octaves. But you add them together, this is what you get. And it really adds to that classic B3 90s feel. <laughs> Now, speaking of fake guitars, right at the back end here, I've got a fake Stratocaster patch. Now, none of these fake guitars sound any good in isolation, but here's the part. But listen to it actually in the track. <laughs> You would be forgiven that that is actually a real guitar, and it's just bizarre how these things kind of work sometimes. So it's a great little patch if you just want to add some great little uh, sort of funk rhythm to uh, your parts, but you're not actually a guitar player. Now, the solo, the guitar solo that's happening, is actually a totally playable patch. And it's just one of those things that is purely great fun to have. But now I think we better end this video because it's gone on for way too long. If you've watched all the way up to this point, thank you so much. I really admire your dedication. We really hope you enjoy this pack. I love it a bit. I think it's captured all of the vibes that we really wanted to exceptionally well and hopefully given you a ton of inspiration and a ton of new sounds. I think the best thing we can do now is just play the end piece of this music. It does feel like the sun's come out when you hear it. <laughs>